leaving a cult. So that's a whole thing that we do. And then you get on the outside, you're looking for help, and nobody knows a damn thing about it. There's no roadmap, there's no dummy's guide to cult recovery, and you go to a therapist and they're like, Ugh. You sure you don't have any relationship problems you'd want to talk about instead? Hello everybody, I'm Germ, this is Mentally Diseased, and I've found that the answer to that question is yes, actually, yes therapist, I would like to talk about my relationship problems because there might not be a lot known by the normies about cult recovery, but boy howdy do they know a lot about abusive, narcissistic relationships. And you know what? They're kind of the same thing. I was reading an article recently because for some reason I like to read articles about abusive narcissists even though I'm in a very happy relationship and don't ask me to explain it. And I came across a line that made me stop in my tracks. They were talking about how difficult it can be to get support when you're in an abusive relationship because society has normalized abuse so much and people like to downplay other people's problems. One of the examples they raised was the way people tend to be simultaneously invasive and dismissive of the seriousness of your problem by asking, if you're so unhappy, why don't you just leave? Why don't you just go? If you've been in either situation, that line is familiar to you. Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you over and over again, they're not forcing you to stay here. People can leave of their own free choice. You can leave anytime. Get out of here. Maybe your worldly colleagues have asked you this question, like, what's the big deal? If you hate it so much, just leave. Come on over to my church. But when you're actually in the situation, you know it's not as simple as that. Leaving doesn't just mean losing your relationship or just going to another church. Leaving means losing everything. That's what makes it an abusive relationship. You've been cornered into an impossible situation. And because the situations themselves are so similar, that means the roller coaster you go through afterward is pretty similar too. So behold, my list of things you'll go through after leaving a cult that you'll also go through when leaving an abusive relationship. And uh, oh, my thoughts and prayers to you if you happen to go through both at the same time. Number one. The anger will consume you. When you are in an abusive relationship, all of your emotions are suppressed. Either they've gaslit you into believing that you're ridiculous, or you're just used to walking on eggshells around them. Once you're finally free, all of those emotions bubble forth to overflowing. All the times you wanted to get angry, all the times you wanted to speak your mind, but kept silent instead, they come back to you and you just wanna scream and shout and throw some hands. You will go through exactly the same thing leaving a high control religion. You've been suppressed for years, misled, lied to, taken advantage of, and you feel betrayed. Every day something new will resurface that you'd forgotten about, some old lie or injustice that will set your blood boiling. There is some truth to the angry apostate stereotype because these people have a lot of reasons to be angry. You'll fall down a rabbit hole of rebuttal videos and articles and every new bit of information will feel more scandalous than the last. The anger does fade. I promise you, your instincts may be to bottle it up, keep a stiff upper lip, but after that many years of already bottling up your emotions, I think the worst thing you can do is to keep burying your emotions. No, no, go ahead and confront it. Let those emotions run their course. Binge watch rebuttal videos all day long. Talk to people, cry it out, do some journaling. Feeling a bit of anger and resentment is completely normal and you've been gaslit enough in your life to keep on gaslighting yourself. But try not to stay in that place for too long. Eventually you'll reach a point where it's either time to move on or time to do something about it. Recognize when you've reached that point and take the next step. Number two, self-doubt and guilt can almost send you back. In an abusive relationship, you are often made to feel guilty after you've stood up for yourself. Even if you've left the relationship, you doubt your decision. They really did love me, didn't they? Maybe I'm being unreasonable. Wasn't I lucky to have them? This is all my fault, really. I sabotaged the relationship. I'm being selfish. I deserve what's happening to me. 
Sound familiar? Abusive people, whether they're a spouse or a whole ass religion, have an uncanny way of gaslighting you into believing you're being ridiculous. What if the end's really coming soon? What if they're right? Of course they're right. I screwed up. I'm being selfish. They're just being the way they're being out of love for me because they're the only ones that ever really cared. Shifting the blame is a common tactic used by abusers. They distort your sense of reality to stop you from questioning their behavior and damage your ability to trust your own judgment because the most dangerous thing to them is a person that can think for themselves and view their actions objectively. If you do go back, oh yeah, they'll be as charming as you best remembered them. So happy to have you back. Wasn't all that for the best? Oh, we're so glad you came to your senses. Love bomb, love bomb, love bomb, love bomb. But eventually, once they have you back and all is forgiven and forgotten, they'll fall right back to their old behaviors again. Three, you're starting your life over from scratch. When you leave an abusive relationship, especially if it's someone you've married to or lived with, it can feel like you're starting life all over again. Finding a new place to live, losing a lot of your possessions, and if they really were a narcissist and were deeply embedded in your social networks, you could also find yourself without friends or family supporting you through it. Abusive people love a good smear campaign, and they will go to those closest to you and try to demonize you to them. Sounds an awful lot like what happens with shunning, doesn't it? Many of us find ourselves without a home, without our friends, family, sometimes even losing jobs because we were employed by witnesses. You've lived your whole life for an organization, set aside all other pursuits because that's what they told you to do, and now you're out in the real world alone and aching with this perceived loss of purpose. What do you do now? Was it really worth losing all of this? You may find yourself regretting your decision, longing for the life you'd built before and now lost. Same as with an abusive relationship, while the loss feels dire in the moment, later on down the road, you will realize that you did actually stand to gain a lot despite all this loss. And they're all things that abusive relationship or cult could never give you. A bit of self-respect. How about some dignity? The entire concept of boundaries, confidence, and maybe a beard or some tattoos. Number four, safety is not guaranteed. Okay, so this one has the potential to be much worse from the abusive ex-spouse side of things. Fear for your safety and escaping harassment are definite potential factors. As we've talked about before, an abusive person loves to run a smear campaign to the point of harassment. You could be facing stalking or worried for your physical safety. It may get to a point that you actually have to move to escape it. There are some religions where you face exactly the same consequences like Scientology with their fair game practices. If you faded from Jehovah's Witnesses, you're also worried about elders stalking you or nosy friends digging into your business, looking for ways to finally out you as an apostate. I remember the case of Brandon Fickwit, who moved all the way across the country and still got a knock on the door from elders he'd never met before, from a congregation he'd never been to, demanding answers for his sex life. If you live in a very small town, you have to worry about what I call tiny town cancel culture. When rumors begin to spread about you, not just to people of your former faith, but also to everyone else in the town too, your ability to survive can be at risk. Small towns have limited job prospects, and people may suddenly not want to hire you or patron your business anymore if you run one. My dad did this to my mom. And it was all ministerial servants and pioneers and elders who did all the rumor mongering. Good times. Sometimes it feels like moving across the country is the only way to protect yourself from this and give you the space to start a new life, but as we saw with Brandon Fickwit, it doesn't always work. Number five, you're meeting yourself for the very first time. In both an abusive relationship and in a high control religion, you spend your time being quiet, submissive, and burying your feelings to just go with the flow. You don't want to poke the bear, but the moment you've hit your limit, 
it is like the Hulk ripping out of Bruce Banner's smart little trousers. This creature bursts out of you that you never even knew was there. You have had enough and you are not taking it anymore. You know what you stand to lose, but you're making a stand for yourself regardless of the risks. And that takes an incredible amount of courage you never knew yourself capable of. The big green brute stomping around right now might scare you at first, but give it a chance. You're gonna learn to love that thing after you get to know it. Number six, you discover who your friends really are. When leaving an abusive relationship, you may find that your friends aren't really the friends you thought they were. Some of them were only fair weather friends, happy to be all up in your business while things are sunshine and rainbows, but mysteriously they've disappeared now that you need a shoulder to cry on. Some of them might have even abandoned you for your abuser. Isn't that great? Of course, the same thing happens when you leave a cult. We all know this. You may find that even though you expected a lot of the abandonment, there will be some people who you thought had your back up until now. And now they've disappeared. People who you thought might be having doubts or they just weren't really into that religion. You thought maybe they were fading too. And now suddenly they are super engaged now that somebody's banged the shunning gong. <laughs> They are, of course, conditioned to think they're doing the right thing, just as friends in an abusive relationship believe the lies of your ex and abandon you for them. They, they're just thinking that they're supporting the right person. 7. You will approach relationships differently. You will have trust issues, and you will be needy. After you've been betrayed by pretty much everyone you've ever known, Every person you meet from thereafter will probably seem a little bit suspicious. People who flake after you've made plans, liars, inconsistent behavior, you will see it in everything anybody does. People who survive abuse love differently no matter how well adjusted they are. They have difficulty trusting new people. They require reassurance, security, and transparency. The slightest whiff of a red flag and they're out the door. I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing. Learning to respect yourself and set boundaries is an invaluable thing you stand to gain out of escaping abuse. You know your value now, and you're not going to put up with any baloney. That's a good thing. It was people taking advantage of your trust that landed you where you were before. The area to be careful of here is that high control religions also teach you a very black and white mindset. People are either all good or all bad. There's no gray areas. You can go from being best friends with someone one day, but they take too long to text you back and are kind of short with their reply, and the next day, you are suddenly public enemies. It's not too much to ask that people in your life are reliable, that they're honest, and have as much respect for you as you do yourself. But it's important to also shed that black and white mindset. Remember that everyone makes mistakes, including you. Make sure that you are clearly communicating your boundaries before declaring enemies out of your best friend. 8. You might relapse without realizing it. Nobody is more at risk for falling into an abusive relationship than someone who dealt with abuse growing up. You'll often hear the phrase, I married my father, or that guy's got some mommy issues. Your parents are the first people you learn to love, even if they were abusive and we are subconsciously attracted to people that remind us of them because it feels familiar, it feels like home. A setback for someone escaping an abusive relationship may mean that even though they thought they'd learned, a year later, they found themselves in a new relationship with someone just like the last one. For people born into a high control religious group, high control was the first and only thing they ever knew. Jehovah may have been the first thing they ever loved, or more accurately, the society. Order and control may feel familiar and comfortable to them. Having a leader to tell them what to think and what to do. Being part of an in-group. They've got it right, everyone else has got it wrong. Some people feel like they need that. Just as victims of abuse tend to gravitate toward abusers, ex-cult members can find themselves falling into cultish ways of thinking. And it's not always so cut and dry as joining another religious cult. It can manifest in the form of political groups, social movements. Dig a little deeper and it can be falling for dishonest 
experts, multi-level marketing schemes. Be careful who you follow. Just because they're not strictly religious does not make them any less detrimental. Instead of finding a new person to follow, maybe it might be worth exploring why you feel the need to follow anybody to begin with. I don't know, I'm just saying. Nine, takes a long time to recover from. Long-term narcissistic abuse results in complex trauma that leaves scars that never fully go away. Those scars may heal, they may fade, you may forget about them, but they're always there. Your experiences will always inform you how you approach the world, and there is no erasing that. If you're the current spouse of an abuse survivor, it can be difficult to navigate how to best go about supporting them. We've talked about this on my channel before in my video, why don't XJWs just get over it? They do get over it and usually end up much stronger people in the long run for it, but it takes time, a long time, and it's not something that you can just ignore. A sizable amount of my viewers are never JWs. They're just here trying to learn about what their ex-JW partner has been through and how to support them. But all that work is worth it because eventually you come to number 10. You learn to love yourself. New me, who dis? That big scary Hulk guy that just came out of me is actually pretty cool. In abusive relationships, they make you feel like you couldn't live without them. They're the only ones who could ever love you with all your flaws and imperfections. They made you feel tiny and insignificant and you hid yourself away because you really believed when they told you that you couldn't survive without them. And now here you are, surviving proving them wrong. It's the same as leaving a cult, isn't it? You were set up to believe that you wouldn't survive in the world, that you have to modify yourself and put on the new personality in order to make it. And now that you're not, now that you're finding out who you really are, you're realizing, hey, I'm pretty awesome. I'm doing just fine out here in the real world without them. And now here are all these interests you never had time to explore before, all this untapped potential. After you explore and get to know your big green hulk, you'll look back on yourself in a few years and not even recognize that person anymore. You'll look in on those friends that you lost and see that they're the same people they always were. They haven't grown the way you have. They haven't learned anything new. They're still wearing that boring old personality you finally learned to shed because they're still walking on eggshells for their abuser. And it won't hurt so bad thinking about the way they feel about you because the person they knew is a version of you that no longer exists. The new you may not even get along with those people anymore. Did you really have anything in common beyond sharing the same abuser with them? After you've learned to love yourself and stand up for yourself, you will find new friends that love the real you in an environment where such things aren't conditional. But reaching that point takes a lot of time and a lot of work. Getting therapy is going to help you get there a lot faster than doing it on your own. Believe me, I know. But you may find that your therapist doesn't fully grasp or understand where you're coming from. If that's the case, try framing it from the perspective of recovering from narcissistic abuse. It's very similar and that's a language that they know how to speak. If you can't afford a therapist, find and read some books about it. There's even some great YouTubers. Dr. Romani is one of my favorites and I would love to see her cover cults more because much of the same advice applies. Dr. Romani, if you're watching this, call me. I'd love to work with you. Thank you for watching as always. If you like this video and you wanna see more, don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell so you don't miss any of my videos. Take care. Thank you to Covert Fade, Fire Shard, Mabity Babity, Sherry DeSouza, Soul Rings, and all my supporters on Patreon that keep me going. If you'd like to support the show, visit patreon.com slash mentally diseased.